Welcome Padawans. This is the continuation of the 8.2 notes that we started on Wednesday and Thursday. As you watch this Edpuzzle video, go ahead and continue filling in your notes and then also make sure that you're answering the 8.2 questions that go along with them. If you missed any of the formative questions, don't worry. I'll go over the first couple here at the beginning and then we'll continue with the rest as we go through the rest of the notes. So the first formative question is asking, biologically speaking, can you evolve? So think about what we've talked about so far with the process of evolution. Evolution acts on a population, not on individuals. Question number two, we were talking about the fossil record. So related to that, when looking at these layers of Earth, which layer would be the oldest? Layer A, layer B, layer C, or layer D. There is a principle at play here called the law of superposition. So for something to be buried underneath layers of rock, the layers that are the lowest had to be there first for other layers to be piled on top of them. So continuing into the evidences of evolution. The third piece of evidence, this piece to the puzzle that creates the picture of evolution, is taxonomy. Taxonomy is the system by which we classify living things. And Linnaeus, who came up with this system of taxonomy that we use today, first started classifying living things by their similarities. Which characteristics do they have in common? Well, it turns out a lot of organisms have characteristics in common because they have an evolutionary relationship. As we've talked about already, dogs and wolves are very similar to each other because they have a common ancestor. So what we can think of is that if two organisms have very similar characteristics, then there's a high likelihood that they have a common ancestry. And this is how we organize things taxonomically through domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So if two organisms, like a dog and a wolf, share the same genus, that's telling us that they have a lot of characteristics in common, so they must have very similar evolutionary origins. If you have two other organisms, like a dog and a cat, who only share up to the order level of taxonomy, well, that tells us that they have fewer characteristics in common, uh, so they must have a much more distant evolutionary relationship. So which taxons correctly show the levels going from general to specific? The system of taxonomy allows us to build these evolutionary trees like Darwin talked about in his writings. So this particular tree here is showing the evolutionary history of primates. Humans, of course, fall into the primate family. The closest living relative to humans today is the chimpanzee. Now, that's not to say that humans evolved from chimpanzees. It's just that if we travel back in time far enough, you're going to find a common ancestor where both humans and chimpanzees share. And then if you travel back in time f even further still, you're going to find a common ancestor where humans and chimpanzees have a common ancestor with their closest living relative, which is the gorilla. And if you go back and back and back and back, eventually you're going to find a common ancestor amongst humans and all the other primates. And continuing even further, you'll find a common ancestor with humans and other mammals, then humans and then other eukaryotes, all the way back to the original life form, uh, dating back somewhere around 3.8 billion years ago. Now the third piece of evidence for evolution is that of homologous structures. Homologous structures are body parts that are similar because of common ancestry. This is part of what we call comparative anatomy. So take for example the diagrams that we have here. On the left we have a diagram of the human arm. So the human arm has several bones that make up its structure. The upper arm is made of one long bone called the humerus. Then the lower arm is made out of two smaller bones called the ulna and the radius. Your wrist is made up of a bunch of square blocky bones called the carpals and then the back of your hand is made out of what is called the metacarpals, and then your fingers are made out of bones called your phalanges. Now compare that to the arms or the forelimbs of 
several different mammals. Here we have a cat, a whale, and a bat. Okay. If you look at the cat's front leg, it has all of the same bones in all of the same positions as the human arm. This suggests that humans and cats have a common ancestry, because why would these organisms that are fairly different from each other have the same kinds of bones if it wasn't for some common ancestor? So it's kind of like saying, everybody in my family has blue eyes. Well, why? Because we have an ancestor parents, grandparents, great-grandparents that also had blue eyes. So the reason why you have blue eyes is because that was passed on to you from your relatives. So homologous structures suggest that these more complicated structures were passed on by more distant relatives. Now what gets really interesting here is when you look at uh, the flipper of a whale and the wing of a bat. Okay? These are the forelimbs of other mammals and they contain all of the same bones. But you'll notice that the bones are in slightly different proportions. The whale's bones are uh, far more blocky and stubby uh, in comparison to the wing of a bat, which is more elongated. Now, the interesting thing here is you might ask the question, why does a whale need all these bones in its flipper? Because the flipper doesn't move the same way that an arm or a leg moves. The answer to that question is that the flipper evolved from a different structure altogether. We can actually look at the evolution of the whale, and this is actually something that's really fascinating because whales are water-dwelling organisms, but they originated as land-dwelling animals. So there is a lot of fossil evidence that supports this. And when we look at the whale, it has structures like its flipper that is hard to explain why it's built this way until we start looking at it from the perspective of this is an evolutionary leftover from when its flipper was once something very different. So the story of the whale is kind of interesting. It started out as a land-dwelling organism, and that land-dwelling organism probably lived near the coastline or near the shoreline and found an advantage to hopping in the water from time to time and swimming around and finding food uh, in an environment like that. Uh, think about like an alligator or a crocodile. It can, it's quite happy walking on land, but also spends quite a bit of time in water. So alligators and crocodiles have adaptations which make them pretty good swimmers. So imagine you have a, a land-dwelling organism that is starting to spend time in the water. And generation after generation, it's spending more and more time in the water, and it's gaining adaptations which make it well-suited for hopping in and swimming around. And eventually, these adaptations accumulate to the point where this organism is spending more and more time in the water and less and less time on land. And then eventually, it becomes a full aquatic organism uh, like the whale. People look at this and think of it as kind of a fantastical story that we have a land-dwelling organism that all of a sudden becomes an aquatic organism. But we got to remember when it comes to evolution, it's never really all of the sudden. We have multiple generations, millions of years in this case, of adaptation and changing to their environment. And there's some compelling evidence that actually supports this idea. If we look at the skeleton of a whale, it has hip bones. Whales don't have hind limbs. They don't have flippers in the back. They have one big tail. So the question is, why do they have these hip bones? The hip bones are actually the leftover remnants of when they had hind limbs, such as their wrist bones, their carpals, are the leftover of when their flippers were once walking legs. So the next formative question, based on homology, that is the homologous structures that we're looking at, which of these vertebrates would you assume are most closely related? Now, the answer to this is probably a little bit surprising. So we might assume that the human and the cat are most closely related because if we look at their, the structures of their bones, these are the ones that look the most alike. But the reality of it is that the cat and the whale actually have a more recent ancestor to each other. So if we think about this in terms of an evolutionary tree, the tree branch that led to humans branched off much earlier than the branches that led to a cat and the whale. 
So the answer to this question is B. The human and the cat is what we might assume are the most closely related, but that's not really what the evidence shows us. And this is where evolution can get a little bit confusing, is because sometimes what is the most obvious answer is not the real answer. So what we have to do is we have to look at all the different pieces of evidences and put them all together instead of looking at one piece of evidence individually. A giraffe looks perfectly suited for its environment, but that long neck hides a stunning error of evolutionary engineering. Although it's just a few inches from the brain, the nerves controlling a giraffe's voice box take a 15-foot detour before reaching their destination. We're wired up the same way. The nerve letting me talk to you right now is wrapped around my aorta. In our fish ancestors, that nerve connected brain to gills, but as gills gave way to lungs and heads moved forward, things got a little tangled. Our bodies are full of examples proving evolution can be kind of dumb. Why else would the waste management system be built by the amusement park? Why else would we eat, drink, and breathe all through the same hole? Why do we get cavities or cancer? Why else would I be wearing these? Because natural selection isn't about survival of the fittest. It's more like survival of the good enough. Nature can't draw up a body from scratch. It can only tweak existing plans. And if a plan works well enough to allow an organism to reproduce, it gets passed on, tangled wiring and all. Life may not be logical, but you know I'm speaking from the heart when I say, hey, congratulations on being good enough. Stay curious. So something to remember about evolution is that evolution is about taking the adaptations that an organism already has and promoting those adaptations. So evolution doesn't like totally rewrite an organism's genes just because one trait might be better than another. So if we think about the example of the goofers and the chompers, the goofers already had the characteristic of being blue in addition to being red and purple. So blue just happened to be the best trait for that environment. So natural selection and evolution didn't like make the goofers blue, they just naturally were blue, and it just happened to be that blue was the color that gave them the survival advantage. So evolution basically just promotes the traits that work the best. And sometimes that means that it's promoting traits that are not necessarily well designed. So the example given in the video here, the larynx of the giraffe is connected to the brain of the giraffe through a nerve that is 15 feet long traveling all the way up and back down its neck. So this is evolutionary design but it's not a very good design. So when we use the phrase survival of the fittest, it's kind of misleading. It kind of implies that evolution is promoting the best of the best, but that's not really how it works. Evolution just promotes what's good enough to stay alive at that moment. And as organisms adapt and change, sometimes traits that are not really the best are the ones that get promoted. That actually brings us to the next piece of evidence for evolution, and that is what we call vestigial organs. A vestigial organ is a structure in the body that has no apparent purpose to it. It is thought that these vestigial organs are basically leftovers from previous ancestors. So in the humans, uh, there's a structure known as the appendix. This is attached to your digestive system on your large intestines. The appendix is a structure that doesn't really do a whole lot in the body, but it is thought that it dates back to when humans had a more primitive diet. Today, the appendix is basically just a leftover piece of anatomy that doesn't really have much of a, a, a purpose inside of our body. Now, vestigial organs don't have to be totally useless. Oftentimes, what we find is that vestigial organs are structures that once had a different purpose than what they are used for today. Earlier I talked about how the whale has a hip bone. Now those hip bones really don't have much of a purpose in terms of what hip bones are generally used for, that is for walking or moving some sort of hind limbs. But the whale hip bones actually do serve kind of a purpose in the whale's body today. It actually works as an anchor point for their reproductive organs.
So the hip bone in the whale is considered vestigial because it's no longer being used for its original intention. Even though it's not completely useless, uh, it's not exactly what it was designed for. Look down. No matter what your biological sex, I'm willing to bet most of you have two nipples. If you can't see them, they're probably under your shirt. Some people have even more than two, but that's for another video. It's easy to see why females have two nipples. We're mammals. It's right there in the name. Dogs, cats, pigs, and whales all have nipples too. Like us, they nourish their offspring with milk. Male nipples? Perfect harmony. Not much going on there. If they're not an evolutionary advantage, why hasn't natural selection erased them? Well, because my nipples are cheap and they're not hurting anything. In the eyes of evolution, male nipples don't have much cost, just a little more tissue. But deleting them from the recipe altogether, reprogramming the genes and body development in just one sex, that would cost more. Traits don't have to provide a specific advantage to get passed on. I mean, why is your blood red and an octopus's is blue? It's not because one color is better, it's just a side effect of nature selecting different chemistry for different creatures. And sometimes traits can end up being used for a function different from what nature originally selected. Not every trait is an adaptation, and they don't all have a point. Sometimes they have two. Stay curious. So again, this video kind of illustrates the fact that evolution kind of takes what's there and just modifies it and repurposes it. So the next piece of evidence for evolution is a little bit more complicated. This is comparative embryology. So embryology is the study of the development of an embryo. Remember the embryo is one of the early stages of development in an unborn offspring. And this especially is important when comparing the embryos of vertebrates. So anything with a backbone, humans, dogs, cats, alligators, birds, these are all vertebrate animals. And when we look at their embryos, that is the developing offspring before it's born, there are a lot of very striking similarities. There are several characteristics that all vertebrates share, at least at the embryonic stage. Now a lot of these characteristics are only during the embryonic stage, and they kind of develop out of us as the embryo grows and develops into a fetus and then to a newborn offspring. The similarities in the embryos of developing organisms shows a connection in terms of common ancestry. So all vertebrates, for example, grow in a very particular way so that they have these stages that are very, very similar. But at a certain point in their growth, they're going to diverge and they're going to develop into vastly different things, such as a chicken or an alligator. And the final piece of evidence for evolution that we have here is molecular biology. This is probably the most compelling and probably the strongest piece of evidence that scientists have for evolutionary connections. So when looking at two organisms and asking ourselves how closely related are they, similarities in terms of their shape and their form and things like having fur versus having scales, those kinds of characteristics can be very compelling, but sometimes can be a little bit tricky because some characteristics that we see in, say, animals today have actually evolved in separate directions or have evolved independently of each other. So a surefire way of knowing evolutionary ancestry is by looking at the DNA itself. So looking at the genetic code and then the subsequent proteins that that genetic code leads to. So you might have heard a statement being made that humans share about 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees. Now what does that actually mean? Does that mean if I stand in front of my microwave for too long and I mutate 1% of my genes, I'm going to wake up as a chimpanzee one day? No, that's not how it works. So what we mean by humans and chimpanzees sharing 99% of their DNA is that when we look at the body of a chimpanzee, they have certain structures that are similar to the structures we find in our bodies. 
Take, for example, our muscles. The muscles in humans are made out of two really important proteins called actin and myosin. When we look at the muscles of a chimpanzee, they have the exact same actin and myosin proteins inside of their muscles. As we talked about in the last unit, DNA is the recipe for proteins. So if two organisms have similar proteins, then they are going to have similar DNA sequences in order to make those proteins. So what scientists have found is that organisms with a lot of the same proteins have a lot of the same DNA. And the question of, well, why would they have such similar DNA? Well, it's kind of the same reason why your DNA is similar to your parents' DNA, or why your DNA is similar to like a sibling's DNA. is because you're getting that DNA from an ancestor, from a common source. In this case, the DNA is coming from a ancestor that may date back millions of years ago. Take a perfectly good book and start changing letters, and it won't take long before it's unreadable. Information has been lost. Then how did evolution, through a similar process, morph the simplest life forms into the most complex? Evolution can create information. Many people think this is impossible, but there's several ways we know it happens. When DNA is copied or shuffled to make sperm or eggs, genes or sets of genes can be duplicated. With an extra copy no longer constrained by natural selection, the duplicate is free to take on a new role. Nearly all flowering plants and many grasses have had their entire genome duplicated at least once. Organisms can also swap or steal genetic material. This is most common in bacteria and other microbes, but a good portion of your genome is the remnants of ancient retroviruses, while nearly half can be traced to even smaller genetic invaders. These DNA parasites are actually natural selection at its smallest scale, individual units of information trying to pass on to the next generation via you. Evolution can create information. Nature's story may not have an end in mind, but it has no problem adding new pages to the book of life. Stay curious. So the question might be, why is evolution so important? Why is it important to understand and study the science of evolution? Well, first of all, evolution is what we consider a unifying theory in all of biology. The idea of evolution ties together pretty much all aspects of biology, everything from cellular biology to looking at the ecosystems. So uh, it's important to understand evolution so that we can understand how all these things fit together. Evolution helps us understand our place amongst nature and living things. It's very easy as a human being to think that we're somehow removed from nature, but that's just not the case. And as we research and understand more about the world around us, we realize that we are connected with all life. And that connection is very profound. As we've already said, evolution also helps us classify living things correctly. The science of taxonomy is directly tied to evolutionary history. A lot of the medications that we use today are designed and tested on other animals. The reason why this works is because these animals have an evolutionary connection to us. So a lot of their physiology, a lot of their anatomy is similar to what we have. So if a medication works on a test subject like a rat, then there's a high probability that it'll work on a test subject such as a human. The question of why do species evolve is because the earth is a constantly changing environment. Remember, evolution doesn't really have a end goal. There's no specific purpose that evolution is trying to drive us to. Evolution is all about allowing species to survive in the environment they're living in. So again, we can talk about survival of the fittest, or more accurately, survival of the fit enough. So as the environment changes, organisms need to evolve to meet those changes. Otherwise, the other option is to go extinct. So the final formative question we have here is, what would be a likely consequence if a population in a changing environment lacks genetic diversity? I.e., every member of the population is mostly the same. So think about this for a moment. Think about a population where 
you have lots of diversity, where you have lots of different kinds of individuals versus a population where everybody is pretty much the same. Imagine you have a environmental change where the environment you're living in is getting much, much colder. In a population where there's a great amount of diversity, there could be individuals that are better suited to living in those colder environments. But in a population where everybody is the same, well, everybody would have about the same tolerance to that cold weather. So what does that ultimately mean for that population? So that's the end of the 8.2 notes. Make sure you have completed all your notes and also make sure that you've answered all the formative questions and submitted those in Canvas.